Greetings. And to those who are at home on this cold day, goodness sakes, it's cold outside. And uh, what a privilege to be together. I want to pray. Lord Jesus, this is a holy privilege that you give to me and that you give to us together to open the Bible. It exposes us to truth, to wonders that we would never think of ourselves. Not a page in this book would come to us naturally. And so we come to one page in this book. I pray that you would, that you would uh, speak. I pray you'd forgive my sins so that there's nothing that hinders me. I pray that you would help my brothers and sisters here and in their homes whether they listen in this hour or some other time this week, whenever that we would hear you speak to us. So enable me and enable us to attend to you. For Jesus' sake, amen. When Louis Dooley was 19 years old, he was sentenced to life in prison for armed robbery. Uh, he was uh, held for a while at Cook County Jail. And while he was there, he was befriended, really against his will, as he tells it. He didn't want these friends. By uh, some Christians. And when he was transferred to a state penitentiary, they forwarded his name to Christians in that prison to pursue Lewis, which they did. And he eventually trusted Jesus as his savior. They loved him there and taught him the Bible. He began to take Bible correspondence courses, and he eventually took 80, over 80, Bible correspondence courses. We'd probably be better off if we had taken some Bible correspondence courses, right? And then, remember, he was sentenced to life in prison. After some 13 years, he was granted parole. And today, even his parole has ended. He's a free man. He said to me, I've never felt so free. Today, Lewis is the regional director for Set Free Ministries. I think it's based in Chicago. Who have, at least he is. Uh, and they have a remarkable ministry through the Emmaus Correspondence School. Especially among prisoners who take these correspondence courses. Lewis helps folks come to Christ and grow through the study of the Bible. I met him several years ago at a small pastor's gathering because I told a friend I was going to preach on Philemon. And he says, oh, you got to meet Lewis. Philemon is his favorite book. I may be stretching it, but I'm guessing that nobody else here, nobody else listening would say Philemon. Now that is my favorite book. I'm not trying to insult you, but I'm guessing a bunch of you can't even find Philemon and you haven't read it in a long, long time. Let me tell you about Philemon. He was a fairly wealthy Christian man who lived in the city of Colossae which is in Turkey, in our uh, maps, the church evidently met in his home. It's Colossian church, met in his home. He was a good and godly man, widely respected and well-known in the Christian community. But when he was summoned to the door one day, he could hardly have been prepared for what was about to happen. There were two men there. Actually, one was named Tychicus. Tychicus came as a messenger. And that wasn't really the big surprise. The surprise was the other guy, Onesimus. Onesimus. And that's the rub. Because Onesimus 
was Philemon's slave, a runaway slave, actually. And runaway slaves didn't just come back, didn't just knock on your door. But there he was, big as life, and he'd come of his own free will. Now, it's important in this story, and really most of the time when we're reading in the New Testament about slaves, to know something, that slaves in that culture were not like slaves that we think of, generally speaking. In that culture, and this is probably true of Onesimus, these slaves were more like indentured servants. That is, they had a big debt to pay to their master, and they'd work it off. So typically 10 years, for example. And so they were bound to that master for those 10 years, and they couldn't leave. Often they could live as they wished. They had a lot of freedoms, but they couldn't leave. They were bound to that master. And Onesimus was probably a slave of that sort. And he had run off. He just took off. There's even the hint in this book that maybe he you know, took the golden candlesticks on his way out the door or something. So he was uh, just evading responsibility. And now when he came to the door, he came as an escaped a fugitive with debts that he really couldn't repay. But there he was, big as life, at Philemon's door. And that was a problem. There was another shocker in this story. Oh, look at this. If you see, who knew that there was a photographer? <laughs> and here we have Tychicus and Philemon appearing to Philemon handing over two letters. And it's so weird how these guys in those old pictures always stand where there's a circle behind them. <laughs> but there they are. Just thought you'd like to see. It's amazing that we still have photographic evidence of these guys. Well, when they both showed up, they told Philemon that they had both been sent to him by the Apostle Paul. Now, Paul by this time was very well known. He was an apostle, a missionary, and uh, we're going to see that he was actually the one who brought Philemon to Christ. He will say in this letter, uh, you owe me your very life. So there's a story there. Now, we don't think Phi uh, Paul had ever been to Colossae, but they had met somewhere. And um, so <laughs> here they come. There's two letters in their hands. One is the letter of the book of Colossians that we have in our Bibles. And the other is this little personal letter to the man, Philemon. It was personal. It's very personal. And yet it was obviously intended to be read to the whole church, which could have been a little dicey, right? Well, turn to Philemon. Can you find it? I'm going to give you about 15 minutes. In your Bibles, the, easy, the biggest book near it is Hebrews. And it's right before Hebrews. Okay, and uh, you can look in your table of contents. Uh, in my Bible, it's one page. It's 25 verses. My Bible has almost 1,700 pages, and this is just one page. It's pretty short. Let me just kind of recap this, and then we're going to read this, uh, all these verses today, because this is the Word of God, and you haven't read it in a while. I'm, getting, I'm betting even if you're reading through the whole Bible, you haven't gotten to Philemon yet, and even if you have read it, at least if you're like me, you might have kind of blasted past it to get to the big one, Hebrews. But here we are. The letter is beginning with, you know how Paul often begins his letter with these very warm greetings to people. This one is effusive. This is longer. He really gushes over these people, and you're going to hear that. And then he gets to the meat of this letter, which is basically Paul saying to Philemon, you got to take Onesimus back, and not just take him back as a slave, but as a brother. What will arrest our attention when you read this is how thick Paul lays it on. 
I mean, he, it's, it's almost coercive. It's almost manipulative if it wasn't for his great love for these people that they had to trust. It's, it's, it's almost, it makes you smile, frankly, to hear how, uh, how heavy he comes on. That's what's going on. He doesn't really leave Philemon a lot of wiggle room, especially since this is read in public, in his own house at the house church that met there. But here, grace is not just what we receive as Christians. Grace is what we do. Grace is what we do. And that's what this story is about. That's what this letter gets to. Now, imagine again how dicey this situation is. Look at that. There's another photograph, another circle behind his head. Oddly, Philemon doesn't get a circle. He's the guy that's looking askance at the beseeching Onesimus there. But we're just so fortunate to have these, um, these photographs. It's amazing to me. You just have to look on Google. Everything's there. So here's Oni, Onesimus, that's what they called him for short, Oni. He's as guilty as sin. He doesn't have a leg to stand on. He owes this his, uh, Philemon money and time, plus the trouble, that, the, 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 the crime. But Paul is pleading with Phil to not only take him back, but to treat him as a beloved brother. That's what's going on here. Why do you think this little book, this little letter, why do you think it made it into our Bibles? Why do you think it's worthy of our attention? It's such a personal little thing, such a strange thing. We don't know anything about a culture like this. Not really. It's kind of hard to just figure it all out. I'll tell you why. Because God will bring people to our church. God will bring people to our church who have made a mess of things. And how we respond to them will determine our reputation before God and our community. The three congregations who have come together to make up Cross Point Church have, so far as I can see as a newcomer, been exemplary in this regard, in opening your doors, sometimes to even uncomfortable, unpredictable people. You are a church who has gambled on grace. So this message is as much an affirmation as anything, a reminder. Now, let's look at this modest little letter, shall we? If you have your Bible open, it's, I like it when you have your Bible or your Bible on your phone or whatever. I, I still can't read my Bible on my phone. I got it in two or three versions. I still just can't do that. But let me just read. Let me read the first seven verses, and you follow along with me one way or the other. Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus. Paul is in Rome, by the way. I didn't mention that. He's in Rome. That's 1,300 miles away. And so this letter traveled a long way. A prisoner of Christ Jesus and Timothy, our brother, to Philemon, now notice all this language, our dear friend and fellow worker, also to Aphia, our sister, probably the wife of Philemon, and Archippus, perhaps a, a grown son or a leader in the church, our fellow soldier. Oh, there's a story there, I bet. We don't call just anybody our fellow soldier. And to the church that meets in your home, grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I always thank my God as I remember you in my prayers. First thing he says, Lord, thank you for that church. And you can read the whole letter, Colossians. Because, why? Because I hear, he's 1,300 miles away, I hear about your love 
for all his holy people. I could say that about you in this church. And about your faith in the Lord Jesus. I could say that about you. Now understand this. I pray that your partnership or your fellowship, your koinonia, your fellowship with us in the faith may be effective in deepening your understanding of every good thing we share for the sake of Christ. That means I pray that because we are together in Christ and what we share even across the miles, that fellowship will help us go deeper into our knowledge of the gospel in Jesus. Then he says, verse 7, Your love has given me great joy and encouragement because you, brother Philemon, have refreshed the hearts of the Lord's people. Oh, that's a great line. Remember that one. You have refreshed the hearts of the Lord's people. So far, so good, right? Listen, brothers and sisters here, you who are watching, you who have invested your lives in one of the three congregations here or who are new like we are, Cross Point Church, like this Colossian church, is a gospel-blessed family. You are a gospel-blessed family. All those things that Paul said of them could rightly, enthusiastically, be said about you. Here in our church are dear brothers and sisters. Here are fellow soldiers in the faith. Think of our uh, brothers and sisters, especially from the Myanmar congregation, who have faced things for Christ's sake that we, the rest of us, can barely imagine. Here in this congregation are time-tested fathers and mothers in the faith. And here are younger believers still churning with energy and excitement that they have come to know Christ. That's who we have, how we've been gathered. What matters most about Crosspoint is having a reputation, as Paul said, of love for all God's people, starting with us, all God's people, all these other churches in town. Wherever we run into believers, we love these folks. We're not in competition. And our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. That's where we stake our reputation. That's what matters about what we do here. So how do we foster that reputation? Well, that's where this letter is going. This, of course, is a setup, right, for what comes next. It's an introduction. So now I want you to listen to Paul's appeal to Philemon and imagine that the whole church is listening to this. Imagine Philemon is sitting down there in the front row and that Onesimus must be somewhere in the crowd. They didn't send him packing. He's not at the Holiday Inn. So imagine the dynamic of this as everybody listens to this letter. So given that you have refreshed the hearts of the Lord's people, Philemon, therefore, although in Christ I could be bold and order you to do what you ought to do, parenthesis, I am an apostle after all, yet I prefer to appeal to you on the basis of love. It's none other than Paul, the apostle Paul, goodness sakes. And look how he identifies himself. I relate to this. An old man, and now also as a prisoner of Christ Jesus, I'm paying the price that I appeal to you for my son, Onesimus. Pause. Maybe your footnote tells you this. Onesimus means useful. Is that crazy or what? His name is useful. He's a slave who ran away. Now, look how he plays this word. I appeal to you for my son Onesimus, who became my son, my son, while I was in chains. Formerly, he was useless to you, but now he has become useful, Onesimus, useful both to you and to me. And the people must be listening, right, how does that work? 
I'm sending him, who is my very heart. You get the sense here, what's going on? I mean, he's slathering it on. Who is my very heart back to you. I would have liked to keep him with me so that I could, that he could take your place in helping me while I'm in chains for the gospel. You know, it's almost guilt-inducing, isn't it? But I didn't want to do anything without your consent so that any favor you do would not seem forced but voluntary. <laughs> Pastor Dave, maybe we ought to lay it on this stick when we're trying to recruit. It's voluntary, but don't forget who I am, right? Perhaps the reason he was separated from you, look, the reason he was separated was he ran away. Well, perhaps the reason he was separated from you for a little while was that you might have him back forever. Remember this part, we'll come back to it. No longer as a slave, but better than a slave, as a dear brother. Maybe that's what this is all about. He's very dear to me, but even dearer to you, both as a fellow man and as a brother in the Lord. So, here we come. Hunker down, Philemon. <laughs> If you consider me a partner, welcome him as you would welcome me. If he has done you any wrong or owes you anything, well, of course he owes him something, right? I mean, he's a runaway slave. He took, in effect, took money from him. If he owes you anything, charge it to me. Where's Paul? He's in prison. He can't put it on his credit card. I, Paul... He doesn't always do this. I, Paul, am writing this with my own hand. I don't have my scribe here. I, uh, I will pay it back. Not to mention, here it is, that you owe me your very self. I do wish, brother, that I may have some benefit from you in the Lord. Refresh my heart in Christ. Remember that phrase? You have refreshed the hearts of the Lord's people. Here it is again. Refresh my heart in Christ. Confident of your obedience, I write to you, knowing that you will do even more than I ask. And then there's this little kicker. Oh, and one more thing. Prepare a guest room for me, because I hope to be restored to you and answer to your prayers. Oh, and you're sitting there in church, and Philemon is sitting there, and Onesimus is sitting there, and every eye in the place is fixed on him. <laughs> Here's something for us. Everyone who comes to our door has been sent by God for the grace he has prepared us to give. Let me say that again. Everyone who comes to our door, I don't just mean through the doors of our building, but through our life doors, has been sent by God for the grace he has prepared us to give. It seems like if God wanted to bring Onesimus to faith in Jesus, it would have been a whole lot more efficient if Philemon would have just led his servant to Jesus. And we could have skipped the whole business of running away and going 1,300 miles to Rome and finding, of all things, Paul in prison and somehow whatever happened there, how did these guys meet and Paul leads him to Christ, then he goes back. It would have just been so much more efficient if Philemon would have just led Onesimus to Christ. It's, uh, it's pretty weird. I mean, here's Paul, a prisoner in chains. What's the chance he's meeting anybody? And he meets a runaway slave. And they get talking. And Onesimus says, well... My master was Philemon of Colossae. Paul goes, Philemon of Colossae? I know that guy. I led him to Jesus. You did? And do you know, pretty soon they're bonded. It's an amazing coincidence. A prisoner leading a runaway slave to Jesus. And Philemon's runaway slave became, he says, a son to Paul. My very heart, he called him. What are the chances of that? In all the coming clean that's part of coming to Christ, both men realized that eventually Onesimus really needed to go back, as priceless as he was to Paul. 
So you see what I mean about this roundabout way that God used to bring Onesimus back to that church, to those people on a Sunday morning. Listen, no one will ever come to this church by accident. I remember one morning when I was pastoring in Beaver Falls, Pennsylvania. I can't even remember what I was preaching about, but in the middle of the sermon, I said, somewhere this morning in the Beaver Valley, somebody got up who hasn't been in church in years and said, I think I'm going to go to church today. And I am not making this up. A guy in the front row goes, here I am. (laughs) I'm speechless. Nobody ever comes by accident. Nobody runs into you by accident. Everyone, some, some of these people who come here, some of you who are here now, were prayed here. Surely there's people you are praying for. There are in our life. We're praying that they will go to church, that they'll meet Christians. Everyone who comes to our church comes via God's GPS which is seldom based on the most direct route. And remember this, they come not only for their sake, but for ours. We need those people. They bring vitality and prayer and kind of a riskiness, a kind of edginess to a congregation. We need those people. Onesimus, the redeemed slave, was as important to the Colossian church as they would be to him. And here's another thing. Everybody who comes is messy. Everyone who comes is messy. Some of us hide our messes better than others. But we're all messy. You're messy. I'm messy. Each one brings a sinful past and maybe not such a great present. We have people coming here who are part of our congregation or any congregation, but let's just keep it at home, who are bullheaded. We have others who are insecure, painfully so. We have those who struggle with depression or anxiety or terrible memories. We have people who are frightened most of the time. And others who just wear us out. (laughs) Everyone brings great battles and heartaches we cannot see. One of my life mottos I first heard from Warren Wiersbe. Wrote in the back of my Bible. Made every class I taught memorize. Be kind for every person you meet is fighting a great battle. But the people who come here also come having been groomed by God and bearing gifts, whether they know it or not, that will make us all richer. When grace comes knocking at the door, We want to be greeters. I want to take some time and tell you about Kim. Kim's a friend of ours. She lives not far and may be here with us uh, in a Sunday soon. I know she'll be watching this. Jim and Evie first met Kim at a store where Kim was handing out food samples. Jim and Evie, being the kind of folks they are, struck up a friendship with Kim and invited her eventually to come to their house. Kim was most most definitely not a Christian. She freely and frequently described herself as an angry atheist. There had been some tough stuff in her life. She was a thoughtful person. She'd come to that conclusion. But Jim and Evie had her to their home and then invited her to ride with them to church. That was interesting. She came, but she was locked and loaded, I'll tell you that. Jim and Evie had a Sunday school class. They brought her to the Sunday school class. She just kind of took over with her questions. 
Some of her questions were just good, hard questions. Some were just skepticism flying loose. And some was just attention-seeking. She kind of dominated the class. It was a little tricky, actually. And people quietly, persistently prayed for Kim. Gradually, she warmed up. She moved from angry atheist to an agnostic. Wasn't sure. Months passed. Gradually, she relaxed among us, and it wasn't just that her questions were answered. It was just being around Christians, seeing our love for one another and for her, which was genuine. She liked the life of our church, and we liked her spunk and her smile. We asked her to be an usher. She was great at it. I can still picture Kim greeting me on Sunday mornings with her big smile. She was just great at it. Meanwhile, God kept dropping little signs along the way. Her sign was this. Of all the crazy things, she'd find a penny. And on the penny, what does it say? In God we trust. And she'd find pennies at the most curious opportunities, times, and see that message. Pennies for crying out loud. God was speaking to her, and she knew God was speaking to her. We formed a choir that year to uh, sing for Good Friday service and Easter morning. And Kim joined the choir, which was great. And so every week we practiced, and she's being um, sort of inundated besides class and Bible study or whatever. She's hearing all these songs, learning these songs about the death of Jesus and his resurrection. So here we go. It was Good Friday night. We were going to sing that night. We came early as a choir to go over everything one more time. We ran through our songs. We're standing up in the choir loft. I'm standing about here. Kim was over here. My friend Jim was over here. Jane, the director, said when we finished, Jim, would you mind closing in prayer? Kim thought she said, Kim. So Kim said, I'd love to. <laughs> we're looking up and down the men's row. We're looking at each other like, what? What's going on here? So Kim bowed her head. We all did. And she prayed. She thanked God beautifully for the gift of his son, for the sacrifice Jesus made on the cross for sinners. She said in her prayer how wonderful it was that God did this and how much God must love us. She said that. And after her amen, I glanced at Rick, who was near me. He was one of our elders, and we kind of looked at each other like this, like, what was that? So we dismissed. We had a few minutes before the service. I found Kim in the hall. I go, Kim, that was quite a prayer. He said, I, that sounded like a Christian praying. And she looked at me like this, and she goes, I guess I am. And within a few minutes, she was, I, I said, Kim, tell Pam what you just told me. And she started telling people about her faith in Jesus. Here's the interesting thing about that whole story. No one led Kim to Christ. We all led Kim to Christ. Our whole church preached. Along with other Christians, a couple other significant Christians in her life from other churches. I grew up hearing this old evangelism man, man, uh, uh, um, saying, adage, each one reach one. Honestly, I, I, that doesn't work. I've never seen that work. That's really not how evangelism typically works. What actually happens is all of us together reach one. When God connects one of us with Kim or an Onesimus, he's really connecting all of us, right? We're all in this. Because, and I want you to remember this line, the whole church preaches. 
the whole church preaches. Everyone who comes to our door has been sent by God for the grace he has prepared us to give. Us, together. The whole church preaches. Now let's move on to another idea here. When God sends someone to our door, welcome them out of love, not duty. That's one of the messages of this letter. <clears throat> welcome them out of love, not duty. Look again just at verses 8 and 9. Therefore, although in Christ I could be bold and order you to do what you ought to do, that's duty, yet I prefer to appeal to you on the basis of love. It's love, Paul is asking for Philemon to love him and to love Onesimus. Listen, as a church, it's one thing to be friendly to neighbors or newcomers. It's another thing to love them. It's challenging to love people, isn't it? Even if they don't come with the kind of baggage that Onesimus had. It's challenging. When people tell me, as they often have over my years, about their trying different churches before they settled on our church, I heard one thing over and over and over, far more than any other thing. And it was this. We went to this church or that one. And no one said a thing to us. With the exception of greeters at the door, no one said a thing. Over and over and over. I know one reason for that is we literally, it's human nature, we literally don't see people we don't know. This is, you've driven down the street and go, I don't think I've ever seen that house before. I've been down there a thousand times. Well, people are like that. They can stand back here in the, in the room and back here and, and you just don't even see them. It's not your fault. It's just the way we are. We see what we know. Love has to kind of shake that off. Love walks back there, walks to the door, walks to the grocery line, walks to the neighborhood with eyes to see, with eyes open. Because God will connect us sometimes with people. I got several in my life that I met sort of incidentally and not everybody, I don't know how it works, there's just some, it's like God goes like an elbow in the ribs, pay attention, call this guy, put him on your list, try him again, see if he wants to have coffee. I don't even know the guy, I know. He's 40 years younger than me, I know. Just call him. Happens at church. That's the kind of people we need to be. Love goes about looking. A few years ago, we were on vacation. We were staying in this big hotel. And I meant to take the elevator to the first floor to get some coffee in the morning, but I hit the basement button by accident. So the doors open, and I'm in the basement. And I look around. You know, it's, it's where the laundry is and where the housekeeping staff gets their stuff, and the, house, uh, the maids were coming. And there door opens in this elevator and I look and there is this huge sign on the wall. It's probably four feet by three feet and it says 15-5 rule. Here's a picture of it. Let's find that picture. 15-5 rule. I go, what's that? So I read on. This is the rest of it. When a guest comes within 15 feet, stop, make eye contact, and smile. Within five feet, we engage and verbally greet the guests. 15-5. I stuck my foot in the elevator door, got my camera out, and took a picture of that. <clears throat> this, maid, <clears throat> this maid was trying to get in the elevator. I go, that's really good. She looked, <laughs> she looked at me like I was really weird. I didn't even belong there. <clears throat> I said, that's, that's really good. She didn't say a word. I said, I, I, I'm going to take that to my church. Then she really looked at me weird. But I did. I took this picture, this very picture, and sent it to my church and said, we're going to do this. And we did. It wasn't so hard. <clears throat> if the housekeeping staff at the Marriott can do it, we can do it. 
We love people. And so in our church, we had uh, some monitors, you know, out in the foyer and stuff. And we would just, it would be a different announcements, you know, for the Sunday morning and stuff like you do here. But we would, one of the slides would come up was just 15 slash 5. It was code. Right? Guests didn't know what that was. But we knew what it was. And people did it. It wasn't that hard. We started to see the people. Now, that's a cool idea, but let me tell you something that's more important, because this doesn't come to us naturally. So I started encouraging myself and my brothers and sisters at church to pray. And we prayed, we prayed two things, but one that I want to mention, this was our prayer. Lord, may everyone who comes through our doors leave thinking. These people really love one another, and they love me. Let's put that up so you see it. It's the next slide. Here it comes. Here it comes. There it is. Can you read that? Lord, may everyone who comes through our door leave thinking, these people really love each other. And they love me. We pray that because it might not happen automatically if we're just left to ourselves. We need the Spirit to do that. All right. Let me... Bring this back to an end. You remember how Paul, uh, uh, Paul said to Philemon at verse 7, You, brother, have refreshed the hearts of the Lord's people. That's a great tribute. I hope that could be said of me. Right? Isn't that great? And then he says at, in verse 20, as I pointed out when I read it, Now refresh my heart in Christ. How? By taking in the likes of Onesimus. So here's the last point. Churches are all conscious of church growth. Pastors live under the burden of church growth, the kind of expectation. The church growth dearest to God is growth in grace. The church growth dearest to God is growth in grace. I imagine you could have heard a pin drop when Philemon read this letter out loud. I mean, Onesimus was sitting right there. It was a squirmy kind of situation. I imagine Philemon finishing up, every eye is fixed on him. It was dead quiet. What's going to happen next? What do you think happened next? Well, because he was a brother who, as Paul put it, was filled with love for all God's holy people, a brother who treasured his partnership with Paul in the faith, I'm pretty sure that Philemon walked over to Onesimus and embraced him. It was a prodigal son story, right there before their eyes, right in church. And I bet there wasn't a dry eye in the house. And I'll tell you another thing. I suspect, strongly suspect, that there was an extraordinarily, extraordinarily rich and joyful time of communion that followed. Paul began this letter, like he always did, grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. And at the end, he ends, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. And the whole story in the middle is a call for grace that only a church that loves Jesus can really give. The first and last word in any church that matters is grace. Not just in our preaching, but in the way our relationships work and the way we reach out. I would pray every single Sunday, Lord, help us not just to be friendly, but to make friends. Let me end with a story. About, about 100 A.D., the early days of the church, there was a bishop in the city of Antioch where Believers were first called Christians. And this man's name was Ignatius. He was imprisoned for his faith in Jesus Christ and was sentenced to be sent to Rome where he would face the lions in the Colosseum. He was eventually martyred there in 107 AD. At one stop in that long journey to Rome, 
The church in Ephesus, which was, uh, you're looking at that map, which was west of Colossae on the sea, a church in Ephesus sent a delegation with their bishop to encourage Ignatius on his way. They were allowed to do that. Soon after that visit, Ignatius wrote them a letter which still survives. Isn't that amazing? He thanked them in this letter for sending their bishop, he writes, whose love surpasses words. I pray that you may love him with a love according to Jesus Christ and that you may all be like him. That bishop's name was Onesimus. Now, it's possible there was another Onesimus, but the timing fits. The bishop of Ephesus prior to this Onesimus was Timothy, Paul's son in the gospel. Ephesus and Colossae were about 130 miles apart, so it wasn't that far. And not only that, but many scholars believe that the first time the letters of Paul were collected into one place, in what eventually becomes our New Testament, were collected around 100 AD in Ephesus, where Bishop Onesimus was the church leader, which might explain how this little gem of a letter found its way into our Bible. Listen, you just never know who God might direct to our door. But when they come, gamble on grace. Amen. Lord Jesus, thank you for this. Thank you, Lord, that being a Christian is never, 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 never meant to be alone. And that it is always your will to bring us into a family. You set the orphans and the widows in families, you say in the Psalms. Thank you for this family, of which we are a part. For the people you have brought in the doors of these congregations over the years. These folks before me, and who listen, some of them at some point were like Onesimus. Who came with messes and were found to be a family in Christ. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you that we can celebrate this union, this communion we have with you and each other in taking these elements together this morning. In Jesus' name, amen.